Hey, Brian from Snake Bites here. Everyone knows the python and boa breeding season is upon us right now, and you might ask yourself, how do I decide what to breed to what? Well, I have a process, and I'm gonna share my ideas with you. You're watching Snake Bites. When I'm deciding what I hope to produce each year when I'm breeding my animals, it's not like I'm just throwing a dart at a dartboard. There's obviously a lot of decision making that goes into it when you have as many animals as we do. While I love all these animals and I certainly want to produce a bunch of animals that I just want to keep, I am running a business and that does mean that it has to be broken down into some economics. And that would be the entry level, the slightly more advanced level, and then the high-end collector's market. Let's take a look at each of these categories and show you some examples of each one. The first group of animals I really want to talk about is the entry level animals. Now when I'm thinking about breeding, I certainly want to produce a whole bunch of these entry level animals because they're really the bread and butter or the animals that keep the lights on and the wheels turning at this business. These animals typically don't cost more than maybe five to seven hundred dollars and most of them are under three hundred dollars. This lesser platinum for instance is about three hundred and fifty dollars but it's not the only entry level animal. Now we want to make sure that we're producing a good number number of these entry level animals because the demand is so high. Again, because these animals don't cost a lot, there's a lot more people that are interested in buying them. Now these people might be someone that just want a really cool pet or maybe even are aspiring to be a breeder and they need these animals to get their breeding project off the ground. There's a lot of animals that fit this need and it's not only ball pythons. The majority of colubrids fit into the entry level category. Like this butter corn is only about $40 to $50 as a baby. But the thing that's different about colubrids as opposed to ball pythons is that most of those base morphs and ball pythons are actually co-dominant or dominant animals bred into normal females. So half the babies are gonna come out looking like that particular phenotype. In corn snakes, king snakes, and milk snakes, and all other colubrids, the majority of them are recessive traits. So this butter corn is actually something that that you're gonna to have to breed to another butter corn to produce more butters unless you wanna start combining them and then you start getting into the next level which is the mid-range level. All right guys, Cow's Question Week. Now I'm sure everybody's seen Brian's Facebook with the pictures of George's face on there and there's been a little bit of controversy about what actually happened to George. I wanna know what you guys think. Text your video, comment below, let me know what you think happened and uh, the winner will get a shout out on a future Snake Bites episode. Hey, did you guys ever want to see the Snake Bites TV crew live? Well, this is going to be your chance if you live in the Chicagoland area. There's an event called Animals After Dark, January 15th from 6 to 9. We're going to be there performing live and talking about all kinds of cool reptiles. If you want more information, go to ChicagoReptileExpos.com. We'll see you there. All right, now that we get into the next level, which is basically the mid-range level, these are animals that are gonna range anywhere from five, seven hundred, all the way up to maybe $5,000. Now you have to remember, the base morphs that we talked about at first are really the morphs that ultimately are the building blocks to produce these morphs here. This is actually a super blast. Now these guys are gonna go for two, three thousand dollars even sometimes, but there's certainly all kinds of different ranges. These are the animals that I certainly want to produce a fair number of, and I really look at it in two ways. I'd be able to sell a number of them for good money, but I also want to keep a number back for future breeding stock. You have to remember that the reason these animals are more valuable is because there's more complexity to them. We're using things like Super Pastel and Pinstripe, so three genes in order to get something like a Super Blast, or a Pastel and a Pinstripe to get a Lemon Blast, so they become more complicated, and then we can take these animals and get it to the next level to really produce that really exclusive animal. Over on the colubrid side, there certainly isn't as many animals that I would consider fit into the mid-range, but there are a handful of them, like these scaleless corn snakes, and certainly a bunch of hognose morphs are right now, but again, they're really cool projects that you have to really think out. And then scaleless corns in particular, I'm starting to breed them into all kinds of color phases, which will take them to that next level when we start producing three and four bang animals that are scaleless. Yeah. 
Now we get to the high end or the really elite animals. These are ones that have taken generations to produce and really are animals that sell for huge money. But to be honest with you, when you're a guy like me, normally when I produce animals like this super pastel soul sucker, I'm not even looking to sell it because I want to not only keep it for a show piece and because I love it so much, but it's also going to make an incredible breeder down the road. Now most of these animals really are in the boa and python market and there's only a few colubrids that get over $5,000. So the majority that I want to show you are some ball pythons that we produced this year and I can only imagine from these animals what's going to happen in future generations. So basically what I'm trying to do is produce the correct number of each one of those three categories. If I can hit that, I consider it a successful year. All right, Brian, it's been a while since we've done a snake myth. A viewer actually sent a pretty good one. They said that if you change the smell of a rodent, say like using vanilla extract, that a snake won't eat it. Well, this is a pretty interesting one because snakes definitely use their Jacobson organ to smell the rodents. So I'm not sure how this one's gonna turn out. We have a few pythons that are due to eat, so why don't you go ahead and get some rats, put some vanilla extract on it, and get back to me with what happens. All right, let's do it. We got a rat, we got vanilla extract. Ooh. Oh. All right, maybe that first one was just lucky, so we'll try it again. Rat, vanilla. Two for two. Just be scientific. Let's do one more. So what happened? All right, Brian. So I took three different rats, quarter car washed their <laughs> vanilla, fed them to three different snakes. All three snakes ate them, no hesitation. I'm a little surprised by that, but I don't think we can call this myth either way until Chewy gets bit. What do you think? Hell yeah. Okay, it's time to test one of Brian's theories that never work, but at least it's better than garlic. It smells good. So, let's give it a try. Like it's gonna work. Ah! <laughs> That's right. Give Chewy a gift of not biting him. <laughs> okay, 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 it worked. Ow, let go! Ow! So in the interest of science, let's try the hand without the vanilla. Like this is not gonna work. <laughs> <gasps> I'm glad I... Oh, annoying little... Ow! Well, it looks like it works like Brian's theories always work. They don't, and I get bit. So what happened? All right, Bryce, so we took Chewy, put a little vanilla in his hand, he got bit. We tried it without the vanilla, he still got bit. I tell you what, I'm not sure that the Chewy thing had anything to do with this one, but it's probably pretty fun to watch Chewy get bit. All right, so we can call this fact or fiction. This one's total fiction, 100%. For this week's Common of the Week on the Snake Scare Me episode, the question was, what are some of your irrational fears? And Florida Herper said, I have moronophobia. I'm absolutely terrified of morons. I just can't stand them and would never be as brave as Brian to let one crawl on me. LOL, for example, whenever I see on TV or even read about the group of morons known as politicians that are trying to take away our rights as responsible reptile keepers, I start to feel sick and usually end up running away screaming. Hopefully some of the Snake Bites crew shared this phobia with me and will make this commitment of the week worthy. Smiley face. Yeah, there's no doubt. I think all of us have a little moronophobia in us for sure. Until next time, you guys keep sending me creative comments. I'm going to feature you on a future episode. 
So there it is. I hope you guys enjoyed the show and had a chance to look at the process I use each year when I'm deciding on what snakes to breed. Make sure to keep an eye on Snake Bites TV's Facebook page because each week I'm going to shout out a cool community that blows it up over there. And this week it was iHerp.com. Good job, guys. And next week we're going to take a look at some reptiles that fit your specific lifestyle. Until next time, this has been Snake Bites.